Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Marilyn Castriata. <clears throat> I'm the Community Engagement Manager with Kestrel Land Trust based in Amherst. As many of you know, the mission of Kestrel Land Trust is to conserve and care for forests, farmlands, and riverways in the Connecticut River Valley in Western Massachusetts while nurturing an enduring love of the land. Tonight's program is the first of our 2023 wildlife and wild plants in a changing climate speaker series. As we all know, our rapidly warming planet is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced and we need to make use of all the solutions and tools we can to address it. Of course, the impact of climate change on aquatic species and what's being done to protect their habitats is of great interest and importance. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rebecca Quinones, a climate change specialist for Mass Wildlife. She has 20 plus years of experience in connecting research science with resource management. Uh, she specializes in native fish conservation, including the development of climate adaptation actions involving dam removal, in-stream flow protection, and habitat restoration. As both a researcher and manager, her work has taken her to four countries and across several states. And Dr. Quinones has given me permission to call her Becca. <laughs> so without any further ado, welcome Becca. Thank you so much for taking time tonight to share with us your work and uh, please begin your presentation. Thank you, Marilyn. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Let's see if I can get things going here. Are my slides visible? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so um, tonight really what I wanna talk about is some of the work that we're doing at Mass Wildlife to not only understand how climate change is impacting aquatic habitats uh, and the species that live in those habitats, but what are the management actions that we can take to either mitigate the impacts or uh, improve conditions that are being felt on the land. And if you're unfamiliar, let's see, with Mass Wildlife, this is our mission. It's a conservation of wildlife through the restoration, protection, and management of habitats for wildlife to thrive and people to enjoy. And here, I just want to point out that I'm an aquatic ecologist. So when we use the term wildlife, we use it very broadly. So that it does include fishes and aquatic species and other aquatic species. There's two parts to my talk tonight. There's gonna to be some background information to set the context for the work that we're doing. So thinking about what the climate change impacts are in Massachusetts and how it's trickling down to the habitats and the animals that we're interested in managing. I'll spend some time on that. And then I'll specifically talk about four studies or four investigations that we're taking a part in. One is looking at how cold water climate change refugia um, are being identified in the landscape, and I'll describe what a refugia is, what the characteristics are that we're looking for. That's largely a modeling exercise. Then we're actually going to dive into some of the refugia areas that we've identified to look at how they're being used by brook trout. So this is kind of a model uh, validation process that we've been going through. Then we're going to talk about how climate change is not just affecting temperature. Largely, when we think about impacts to aquatics, we're thinking about uh, warming temperatures. But certainly, another huge impact we're going to see are those impacts that we're going to see to flow due to the changes in precipitation patterns. And lastly, there's a, a larger uh, project that we've been, we've been working on to look at aquatic uh, species across a broader spectrum. So not just fishes, but looking at freshwater mussels and looking at some of the aquatic insects that live in some of these areas. I want to stress that all of these issues are really highly complex um, and it really, the success of them just uh, it is really dependent on successful collaborations with a bunch of people. And these are just some of the groups we're working with. But I also want to point out that we do work with a lot of land trusts and we work with a lot of municipalities also. Um, beyond researchers and other um, NGOs that are out there. 
So let me dive into climate change. Uh, in the state of Massachusetts, there's been a lot of work already going on to track what the changes have been thus far. And you can think about them in, in many ways, but I've kind of summarized it in the sense that we're looking at how increases in temperatures are affecting other um, parameters that affect aquatic habitat. So, so far we've seen about a one and a half uh, Fahrenheit, degree Fahrenheit increase in annual temperatures across the board in the Northeast. But what we're seeing is that each season is responding differently. So it's not one and a half degrees across all seasons. It's actually uh, being, the, the effect is actually being felt more markedly in the winter time. In winter, we're seeing about a four um, degree Fahrenheit increase across the board from 1990 to 1999 levels to now. And so that has a huge implication on how we feel precipitation on the landscape. And what's happening, probably not a surprise to anybody, is that we're seeing more uh, rain rather than snow falling. And that when you're talking about rivers and streams, lakes and ponds, that has implications for how floods and how droughts are felt. We're seeing flooding happening about two weeks earlier uh, than we used to in the spring. There tend to be higher peak flows associated with those. And we're also seeing more droughts going on. Those kind of medium droughts that we used to have prior to the 1990s, every two to three years we're seeing um, much more common. Um, and certainly last year was a good example of that. So whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, what we're finding is that uh, researchers are finding that the Northeast is feeling warming faster than other parts of the world. And this is some research that came out of uh, USGS and UMass Amherst. And how you read this graph is that at the bottom is the years. And then here on the, um, on the right column is the percentage of the multiple amounts of, of models that they looked at. So they looked at 32 models. And then they track when different parts of the world would reach a two degree Celsius increase. Um, and what they what they found is if you look at the where the 80% agreement is in models for different parts of the world, you see that the northeastern states actually are going to feel that faster than the continent, the rest of the continental US or even the, uh, the, the rest of the globe. And the reason for that is that we are located in a, in a sort of very special place, right? Here's Massachusetts. We have this large land mass that can absorb a lot of heat and then uh, to our west. And then we have a large ocean to our east that doesn't allow us to cool down. So land tends to absorb heat much faster than the ocean. And the ocean is not letting us release that heat as readily because of, of where we're located. If you are fascinated by how climate change is affecting us, uh, particularly here in the state, you can look at the newest best data compilation, and that just came out as a climate assessment for the state in um, last month. It's available at mass.gov, and what it did is to bring all the new information for different climate hazards, and these are the ones that they looked at. They looked at how changes in temperature are being felt, how changes in precipitation are being felt. Um, how that's affecting the seasons, particularly the length of the growing season, what that the ramifications that might have on vegetation and changes in the ecosystem are particular, particularly interesting to me, and also sea level rise. And that effort, this climate assessment effort, was a precursor then to start drawing up the state hazard mitigation and climate adaptation plan. This is a, what we call the SHIM campaign. And what now we're in the progress of using all this information to then look at specific risks, specific hazards. And these are some that I've listed here. We're looking at how extreme weather events are gonna affect different sectors, things like economy, the governance, the natural environment, infrastructure. Um, and so there's a wealth of information that is gonna be available um, for folks to, to really understand how climate change is being felt in the state. I'm just gonna to touch on how temperature and how um, precipitation are being felt right now and what we're, we could be expecting in the near future and near far future. And it, you might be familiar with an image like this where you have kind of the Eastern seaboard and there's little um, diagrams of Massachusetts. And what this is trying to convey is that right now, 
we're feeling, you know, here we are sitting in our, in our summer uh, and weather patterns that we're feeling right now. Uh, historically, the summer really just felt like it was 81 degrees. But by 2030, that summer temperature is going to feel very much like today's New York. By 2050, we're expecting it to be much warmer and coming into something like Maryland by 2070, feeling like it's, it's something like in the South Carolina or North Carolina. And then by 2090, by it's something kind of like um, what we would see in Georgia. And this is new because even 10 years ago, we were talking about weather in Massachusetts in um, 2090 being more like what we see in the northern boundary of North, of, uh, North and South Carolina and this boundary here. So this is showing that there is definitely a warming trend that we're going to be feeling much faster than we initially thought even uh, in the recent past. So that has to do with temperature. The other piece that's really intriguing to us when we're talking about aquatic habitats is how precipitation might affect stream flow. And so this is again from a climate assessment. And if you look at annual changes in precipitation, these are the different gradients that they looked at, um, where the reds are, there's gonna be less precipitation over the course of the year or blues, whether there's going to be um, more precip precipitation. And for the annual um, data, it doesn't really show a lot of change. Certainly there's going to be some drier areas kind of in the um, central part of the state and it may be a little bit more rain in other areas, but annually the change isn't going to be as great as we're going to see seasonally. And so really when we're talking about those dry periods, we're looking at summer conditions. We're sitting here somewhere in Amherst, right? At Gastrol Land Trust. And so you can see that you're gonna be expecting drier summers in the Miller's watershed is really gonna be hit hard as is the Neponset and parts of um, the smaller tributaries in the Southern part of the state. So those are areas to be looking out for. Um, as far as winter, we're expecting more rain generally throughout the um, state, but not necessarily in the Southeast, which tends to linger in, in drought conditions much longer than uh, other parts of the state. So that's kind of a glimpse of what we're expecting uh, given the newest data um, and modeling that we have. So I mentioned the state hazard mitigation and climate adaptation plan that we're working on right now. And the idea is that we take that information and we try to understand how it's impacting different sectors. To me, the most prevalent to my work, uh, relevant to my work is this um, natural environment sector. So I'll touch on that more than anything else, but certainly you should be aware that the human sector was considered as were the infrastructure, governors, and economy sectors. And there's a lot of um, connectivity between these. If you think about the human sector and health of human beings uh, and how the natural environment supports well-being or how infrastructure, failing infrastructure like dams or culverts, how that can affect the water quality below them and how that also impacts natural environment. We understand that there's a lot of interconnectedness, but um, we dealt with it in, in a little more um, siloed way in order to really manage the information, come up with um, the effects that really jump at us, uh, at us as we move forward. So looking at the natural environment sector uh, more closely, what the climate assessment found and is going to be carried forward into the mit hazard mitigation and climate adaptation plan is that the, these were the kind of the issues that rose to the top as far as the negative impacts that we might expect from climate change. There was this concern over freshwater ecosystem degradation due to warming waters, drought, and increased runoff marine ecosystem degradation uh, because of warming, particularly in the Gulf of Maine and ocean acidification, coastal wetland degradation from sea level rise and storm surge, and forest health degradation from warming temperatures, changing precipitation, increasing wildfire frequency, and increasing pest occurrence. And so me, the, all the work that I'm gonna describe now that mass wildlife really falls into trying to understand this aspect of the natural environment that's being impacted by climate change. But something to think about is that not all habitats are gonna be changed in the same manner, right? There's gonna be some areas that are gonna stay largely intact. This is a, a very healthy um, cold water stream in the picture that I'm showing. 
it has a lot of variety in sediment, there's cobble, there's gravel, there's sand, there's a lot of vegetation along the banks, a lot of microhabitat. Um, and then there's going to be some um, streams that are not going to stay as intact. They may change. And it's not unfair to change to show this uh, picture completely because this is certainly um, a stream that has been affected by land uses. But I'm trying to convey the idea that there's going to be streams that are stay more intact over time versus some that are going to be changed perhaps into completely different ecosystems. Um, and they may start looking more um, linear. Uh, you see more fine sediment from higher erosion or scouring that's affecting the stream channel. The vegetation might not be doing as well. You might expect to see more invasive species in these areas. And so one of the first questions that we had at Mass Wildlife is how are fish is going to respond to these changes, right? We have already seen through the Northeast a multitude of, of um, responses. We've seen faster growth in some areas where you have fish in slight, slightly warmer water, but not so warm that's detrimental to them. Their metabolism picks up and they're able to assimilate more food, and so they'll grow faster. But in cases where we exceed the tolerance of the temperature, you may see decreased survival. And we normally see that in fishes, that I'm talking specifically about trout here, uh, larger fishes. They require more energy to just do their bodily function. And so that may become a, an issue for extended growth, uh, their survival. We're also seeing changes in behavior as far as when fishes are migrating, it, whether it's a species that's migrating between the ocean and rivers, whether it's a species that is migrating within rivers to say a tributary mouth to headwater streams, they're doing that about two weeks, two to three weeks earlier than normal. And so that's um, a behavioral way to mitigate it, uh, the effects that they're seeing in their habitats. And we're also, another behavior that we're seeing is that they're doing earlier spawning. They simply are um, moving into spawning beds and building their nests and laying their eggs a lot um, earlier than we have seen in the past. So the number uh, of one study that I want to talk about here is the first study I want to talk about here is talking about these concepts about how different habitats are behaving under climate change. So this came about after I read an article from Tony Lynn Morelli. She is a researcher with USGS based at US Amherst, and she had just published this paper on a concept of climate change refusion. So these are areas that are gonna feel or alter um, a, a due to climate change effects a much slower rate than other areas because they have characteristics that buffer them from those impacts. So when you're looking, for example, here is an example of cold water stream, there's gonna be some streams that don't change as much simply because they're at high elevations, they stay colder for longer, or they have sources of cold water from deep snow, or from groundwater inputs, or there's simply a deep lake that can um, have a thermocline, and so you have cold water at the bottom. And so in those ways, those areas are going to be buffered from increased solar radiation and warming. Likewise, when you have uh, streams that are in valleys, or you, you have more shading, and or have more vegetation, canopy cover, or simply are facing north rather than south. So those are all characteristics that may point to an area being a potential climate change refugia. These are areas that are going to feel climate change at a small, slower, a slower pace. So it turns out that this is a concept that has been floating around in Massachusetts for a while. There's different researchers that have been involved. And one way that research has looked at, have looked at this concept is by looking at the probability of watersheds supporting brook trout into the future. And so brook trout are cold water species. They're very sensitive to warming. Um, and so it makes sense to track how they would change over time and how the probability of their occurrence would change over time. This is work that's been done by Jeff Walker and Ben Letcher at his USGS, the Coney Lab. And this is a fantastic website if you want to visit it. It's ice.ecosheds.org. Um, and you, when you launch this interactive map, you can actually ch choose the scenarios you want to look at for temperatures to see how brook trout is going to be behaving at the watershed scale. 
Now, because management tends to happen at a much smaller scale, rather than a watershed, we're usually working at the stream reach or site scale. I really wanted to apply that modeling, but looking at, at our data. And so what I started with was looking at all the spots where we have cold water species, and these are areas that have been defined as cold water habitat. And the, all of these dots represent um, areas where we've done surveys, Mass Wildlife has done surveys since 1996 and have found cold water species. So that the, my hypothesis was that these areas all behave as potential climate change or fuchsia simply because the fish that require cold water are already there. But then I take that data and I use the models from USGS and move them forward. And so what I found is that now these blue dots that were cold water are changing into these red dots. And what that suggests is that we're losing the ability of streams to support cold water species in summer uh, as we are warming. And so in this case, this is an uh, increase of two degrees Celsius. We're losing about 42% of the sites we had before um, as cold water effusia. I reiterated that model again. And now at four degrees Celsius, we see that it's an additional loss of 28% uh, of cold water streams that are not going to be able to support um, brook trout. And then at a six degree increase, which is projected for uh, beyond 2090, um, we see an additional 45% uh, uh, percent loss. And so from the from today, to this six degree increase, it's about a, a 70 to 80% loss, depending on how you break down um, the data. It's significant and it's a concern because then the, the next question is where, where do these fish go? You know, it's too warm in the summer. Do they go elsewhere or do they stay? What, what happens? Um, this, this information was published in 2021. If you're interested, you can find that information. There's um, a manuscript that we put out through Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. And uh, I hope you'll check it out. It's an open access, so it's available for folks to, to read and, and um, you know, evaluate in your own time. So now we have a concept, a modeled concept of what's happening with climate change or fuchsia. We understand that these are areas that are gonna be warming that perhaps are gonna support brook trout. But then the question, like I mentioned before, is what happens to brook trout? What do they do? How do they behave uh, when these areas are changing? And so um, we started a project with uh, Matt O'Donnell, again at USGS and Conte Lab. And again, thinking about this concept that we have these thermal refugia areas, these climate change refugia areas versus streams that are gonna change. We wanted to test that in the field um, with the idea that there may be some areas where we have these assemblages largely made up of brook trout and, and other cold water species that may be actually shifting to more warm water species simply because the habitat can't sustain them anymore. So what Matt did is he came up with a study design where we chose four streams to look at. Uh, this is Dry Brook uh, in Gill. We had, uh, I'm sorry, Lions Brook in, in Gill, uh, Dry Brook here in Wendell. Uh, and then we had Atherton and Underhill brooks that are uh, tributaries to uh, the Quabbin. And each of these sites are paired sites, meaning one site is slightly warmer than the other, and the other one is slightly colder because we wanted to see if fish in, in the warmer areas are able to withstand warmer temperatures moving forward. The idea is that they're acclimated to slightly warmer conditions and they may be able to withstand uh, those changes that are coming. Um, and so one of the first things that we did in these sites was that we, after we chose the length of the stream that we wanted to look at, we actually went back and took pictures of them with a, a flare camera. This is a camera that takes uh, thermal images. And so the darker, the blue, it's, a, it's the same type of camera contractors use to look for drafts in your home. So the, the darker, the blue, I'm sorry. Um, the colder the temperature, and you can see one of my crewmates here, so we, we come out very hot, but you can actually point it to different parts of the stream and see what temperature uh, you're looking at. Now, cold water species normally prefer uh, temperatures less than 20 degrees Celsius, and so uh, what's curious about is that we, we know that the thermal landscape of a stream is not the same throughout. There's going to be pockets that are colder, maybe because there's groundwater coming in, uh, areas that are going to be warmer. 
And so it wasn't just enough for us to kind of map out the entire habitat. We really wanted to understand where the fish were holding up. So we inserted pit tags into um, and, and thermal tags into some of the fish. Pit tags are uh, unique numbers basically that emit a little uh, way, a little um, uh, a, a signal that can be picked up by this wand right here. And so we can actually tell which fish, if we can find that tag, is holding where. And so once we can locate that fish, we drop uh, a washer here, and then we can very specifically map that specific area that the fish are holding it. So this is just an example of an area where we have a seep coming in and the, where the fish was holding was much colder. And this is the same uh, stream that was showing 24 degrees before. Here is showing that the fish was actually holding at 16. And so that's really interesting to understand because climate change uh, refugia are not um, kind of a single entity. It's, it's, it's the mosaic of different uh, patches that are colder that will sustain these fish um, in, in the summer conditions. So I mentioned that these were paired sites. There's uh, the warm, slightly warmer site, the slightly colder site. And what Matt has done is once we, those fish, um, we finished kind of looking at the movements of fish in those areas, they were removed and recaptured and brought to the lab. And what he's doing is putting them through different lab runs with different temperatures um, to see if they can withstand a different threshold um, for temperatures. And so that's ongoing. He's presenting preliminary results uh, to the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Uh, but look out for that. That work is still coming. It's exciting because it helps us understand, this, this is a question I get a lot, won't just fish adapt? Won't they just be able to deal with the conditions that they're, that they're in? Um, and conceptually, that makes sense because changes have happened in the past. You know, there's the, the concept of evolution and the ability of um, genetic makeup within populations to change in order to deal with changing conditions. But, but the reality is that the changes that we're feeling right now are occurring about 40 times faster than they happen in the past. And so this is it just um, not something, not conditions that at the rate that any of these organisms have ever felt. And so uh, trying to understand what, what they're able to deal with now, it will give us a better understanding of what we can really expect from how these fishes will respond. Okay, so those two studies really focused on looking at temperature and how temperature is gonna be felt in habitats, how temperature um, is gonna affect the responses of fish. But we know, like I mentioned before, that it's not just temperature that is, is affecting aquatics in a big way. We also know that precipitation is gonna be affecting stream flow patterns. And so right now we're in the process of working um, with another USGS branch. Uh, they're wonderful collaborators with us. Um, because we understand that you could have really cold water, but if there is no water, this is one of our sites uh, in the Blackstone River in Scaddenbrook. If there's no water, then the, the point is mute, right? Uh, so, so really understanding how stream flows, everything from peak flows to, um, to drought conditions are affecting these habitats. And here is one of my temperature loggers that absolutely went dry for long periods of time just recently. All right, so going back to this concept of refugia, if you really want to understand refuges of, of or pockets of habitat that are refuges to the to critters uh, from climate change, you really need a network of them. So it's not just areas that are going to be cold, remain cold, but areas where flows are going to stay suitable areas where you're not gonna have input from invasive species or increase, increased in, in predation, for instance, for other species moving in. And so this is a conceptual diagram of what we mean when we're talking about refugia being a network of refuges, where the blue line represents a stream network. So you have kind of that main stem here with some tributaries and some headwater streams. And so part of the year you may have this area that functions really well as a thermal refugia from temperature, a refugia, a climate change refugia from temperature because it remains cold. It's high elevation, it may get some snow input, but it's also really um, 
uh, it has a lot of risk as far as becoming ephemeral or drying up due to droughts, because what we're seeing is that streams are actually shrinking from the headwaters. Uh, these areas are becoming drier um, with warming conditions. And so those fish, again, will need to move somewhere else. Um, you also have areas where you uh, would then need to have um, refuge from droughts. And so if those fish are able to, in Massachusetts, we have more than 3,000 dams and, and culverts, uh, culverts that can be barriers, so that's a concern. If the fish are going to be able to move, then they would have a refuge somewhere else. So this is just to try to bring to head the concept that we can't just think about small patches. We really need to think about the health of entire stream systems and how those habitats interact. And so uh, one of the ways that we're trying to track uh, temperatures with flow is through this project that USGS has been heading where they're taking uh, game cameras and putting them on streams and then being able to calibrate those images to certain flow patterns. And through some fancy modeling, they can then recreate con um, continuous stream flow for a particular site. This is right now happening. Um, they're looking for volunteers. It, it's not very uh, expensive to put a, a game camera on. It, it just needs someone to man um, them sufficiently to download the images. But once we have, this is a piece that is so missing in our research because a lot of the flow gauges that exist right now are in larger systems like Mainstem National River, for instance, if you think about that, versus having them in these tributaries where we're seeing a lot of the impacts, we just don't have a lot of data for that. So um, if anyone is interested in manning a game, game camera and their favorite stream, I'm just putting a plug in for, for that um, project. And the idea is that at the end, we'll have the same map that you saw. This is the blue dots that we had when we had um, the six degree increase in the temperature modeling I showed before. But on top of it, what I've laid down is where we saw um, the same cold water species during a drought in 2016. So in, in this very simplified, non-modeled way, I just used our data to try to understand these areas that then are both climate change refugia from temperature and from flow. And so this was a very simplistic way to um, bring that a topic to head to USGS and say, this is what we're looking for. And so they're going to make it much more sophisticated and more um, more applicable across the entire state rather than having these specific few areas so that we can understand um, where, you know, how we prioritize management and protection of um, areas that act as refugia in, in multiple aspects. All right, so I've talked about uh, concerning um, temperature and impacts on habitat, how fish are responding to temperature, how we're then building on thinking about impacts of temperature and flow across the land. And now what I'm trying to get uh, to is, is this next study is not thinking just about fish. We fish for sure is uh, where we have the most robust data. We have over 12,000 surveys that have been done in the state by Mass Wildlife and then DEP also has some, universities has done some. So we have a lot of data that we can dig into. But we want to think about aquatic biodiversity more holistically, and we want to do that not just at the kind of the municipal or state level, but also think about it regionally. Okay, so for those who are not familiar, what is biodiversity? What do I mean by biodiversity? Biodiversity is a concept that you're looking at the variety of all life, either on Earth, that's like the biggest uh, scale that you can look at, or across a landscape. And it really considers life at different levels. So you can look at biodiversity at the genetic level, um, how much variation is in these brook trout genes in order to deal with temperature is of interest so that that would lead to then their the ability or lack of ability to deal with warming temperatures and it could also consider biodiversity can also consider um, uh, organisms or ecosystems so there are different ways to look at biodiversity for us because we have limitations um, for uh, the data that's available then we started with the fishes but 
the the interest overall is that we're seeing shifts in biodiversity in aquatic habitats happening at a rate five times faster than terrestrial biodiversity and that's across the board in north um north america it's happening even faster or to a greater degree in equatorial regions and in particularly in in areas around africa and in um and, and Central America. So that, that's a huge concern. That's why we, we wanna make sure that we're addressing these issues. And also because aquatic biodiversity and, and whatever happens to aquatic biodiversity has these ripple effects. Their uh, fresh water is supporting species beyond just aquatic species. It, it is an area, those areas support species um, that are traveling through. They're using it as migration corridor, corridors and they're using it as a source of water. Um, and from uh, a strategic conservation um, point of view for mass wildlife, we use this concept of species of greatest conservation. These are species that we really want to focus conservation because they're already in a kind of downward trajectory for abundance of distribution. And when we look at how many uh, species of the 500 and something species that we have are supported by aquatic habitats, it's more than half, it's just over half of the species, it's 290 species. So that just speaks to how important it is to protect um, aquatic biodiversity, but not just the, the aquatic biodiversity itself, it's the habitats that support uh, those, those um, uh, uh, organisms that, that we're concerned about. Okay. So I mentioned that we're really limited by some of the data we have, and luckily we have tons of data on fishes, but we also have a fairly decent amount of data on freshwater mussels. And so we wanted to delve into that too. Uh, Jason Carmignani um, and Paul, uh, Peter Hazelton that uh, worked for the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program at Mass Wildlife before have a pretty good handle on what's going on. As far as partners at UMass, um, and throughout the Eastern Seaboard, there are a lot of pe people who are paying attention to freshwater mussels. And we also pulled in some data from DEP, primarily looking at these index sites that they use for aquatic insects. And with the concept that if you really wanna understand how um, climate change is affecting changes in the habitat, you need to understand the full spectrum of trophic levels. That is meaning you know, the, the aquatic insects are food, for higher level organisms, um, all the way to fishes, all the way to even beyond that. Um, but we really wanted to think about ecosystems as, as more co complex and just uh, represented by a single species. So we started with fishes and we came up with these different metrics that we wanted to incorporate in order to understand where um, our strengths are as far as aquatic biodiversity. We looked at things like native species richness. This is just a measure of how many native species are present in a given stream, pond, or lake, or river. We uh, develop a metric to look at uh, native species biodiversity. This is a measure of looking at how many of the native species that we would expect to be located in a location are still there. So it's a way to think about how um, uh, how, the integrity of that habitat, how strong is that is a habitat still given the changes we've already had in the state. We also looked at the areas where we have the strongest wild trout abundances. Um, that's primarily looking at brook trout. Of course, that's the only native trout that we have in the state. And then we added this other concept of looking at areas where brook trout and slimy sculpin um, assemblages are strong because they tend to be found in very specific headwater streams that are often overlooked when we're thinking about biodiversity. So something that you see a lot of in biodiversity uh, investigations is that you're looking just at areas where they have the highest number of native species or the highest number of, of species overall. And there are gonna be um, some habitats where you don't expect a lot of species. These headwater streams, you're lucky to have these two species, brook trout and slimy sculpin. And so you wanna make sure that you're thinking about areas that may be depauperate um, for species rather than just looking at the most, the area that has the most species. We also were in, in discussions with DMF, uh, the uh, Division of Marine Fisheries to make sure we incorporated these anadromous fish habitats that are really important for things like alewife and blueback herring. Uh, herring. Um, so they provided some um, 
maps where we could actually look at uh, lakes and ponds and rivers that are particularly important to, to those fishes. We looked at two-story ponds. Two-story ponds, I mentioned, um, and when we're talking about climate change or fuchsia, these are these, uh, these ponds that are deep enough where cold water can settle at the bottom. There's a thermocline, kind of a boundary between warm water and cold water. It provides a very specific habitat. They're not very common in Massachusetts. Um, so we wanted to include those as far as uh, adding to the habitat diversity that we wanted to, to protect. And then we also looked at how fish are growing in some of our stagnant waters in the lakes and ponds by looking at a condition factor. And it's just a way to think about um, the length weight relationships of certain species and whether they're doing very well or if they're looking really skinny. And so we wanted to choose those ponds and lakes that are have healthy um, fishes in them. So that those are all the metrics we pulled into to thinking about habitats that support uh, aquatic biodiversity when we're thinking about fishes. Then we uh, added some muscle data also on top of that. And so that these are sites that were identified to have two or more uh, species of greatest conservation need. Those are the species I mentioned where they've been identified uh, as having kind of this um, downward spiral happening either because of abundance or shrinking distributions that are particularly important and we want to make sure we protect those. Um, and then we also um, chose any imperiled species habitat, even if it's just one species in that habitat, we wanted to make sure it's included. All of these metrics, all of this data was put together so that we could come up with a map. <laughs> and so when you look at the top tier of each of those metrics together, you come up with the, what we call the 90th percentile of each of those, and it, it produces a map. This is an area where we think you would need to protect um, or do management or restoration in order to protect aquatic biodiversity at Costa State. It looks like a lot of blue lines because the state is very small, but when you really go in, it is not that much. Um, this it has now been incorporated into Biomap, uh, uh, the latest iteration being at 2022, it came out in November. Biomap is a framework that Mass Wildlife uses um, to protect all biodiversity across the state. It's uh, largely focused on imperiled species, but through the aquatic uh, metrics, we also incorporated these ideas and incorporating uh, all, all species rather than just uh, those that are um, imperiled. Um, if you Google Biomap Massachusetts, you'll get to the page where it shows you all of the uh, Biomap results. And so what I did here is just, just cut out examples of what it would look like if you just looked at, at Amherst. Um, so the very first part of the interactive map will show you the town boundaries and then these um, polygons that are dark green and light green. The dark green areas are what we call core habitats. Those are areas where we know these species are present, that we know are integral to their persistence. And then the lighter blue areas are critical natural landscapes. They are landscapes that we know are needed to support those um, those habitats to make sure that they continue to function as they should. So this is this green incorporates all of the components and include includes things like wetland core, uh, forest core, uh, everything that we looked at as far as all of the biodiversity. But you can actually go in and choose if you wanted to just look at aquatics. And so when you do that, this is what Amherst would look like. You have these uh, deeper blue areas that, again, are the core areas that we think are highly important for protection in order to make sure that aquatic biodiversity persists. And then the, the blue, the lighter blue around it are those buffer areas that we know are important to support that habitat. This is a this lighter blue is a different concept that we have used in the past. This is what we call a um, mixed width buffer. It's it's um, just like knowledge is that in certain areas there's going to be a, a wider buffer than is needed than in other areas. For instance, larger rivers will need wider buffers than headwaters simply because of their location and the influence of the landscapes that they're in. 
And so if you really want to dig in into what information made up each of these core habitats, you can click on it and you, it'll highlight a particular area and you'll see all those metrics I uh, talked about. And so in this case, the native fish biodiversity was not part of the decision making of why that particular um, uh, stream was chosen, but freshwater mussels were, as were a rare species. So that that each of these, you can click on them and know exactly why that decision was made to incorporate them. So, so we've done that for Massachusetts, but one of the um, issues with climate change is that if we want species to succeed, to follow their suitable environment, we need to provide ways for them to either move north or to move upslope. And there's all kinds of issues with that very broad statement, particularly if you're an aquatic uh, species, you need to be in water. And sometimes water doesn't connect those areas. And so um, thinking about what's, what is um, potentially available for a dispersal corridors for species, as well as thinking about the barriers to movement that may be of concern. So this is a, yet another um, project that we've come in looking at all of those um, biodiversity metrics of different species. And what we've done is to bring in biologists from all six uh, New England states to talk about how we think about biodiversity as a regional um, concern as a, a, and a, from a regional perspective. And so the, the challenges are many. We all collect data differently. So standardizing how we look at data in order to come up with metrics that are um, the same across the board has been one big hurdle, but we're getting there. This is a project that was funded by the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. We were able to get a postdoc, Jenny Rogers. She's working with uh, Allison Roy and Grace Dorenzo, um, and she's developing some really fantastic um, preliminary data, but it, it's still ongoing. But the idea is not only do we look at biodiversity in the region and how climate change is gonna change the biodiversity, how is climate change gonna change the assemblages and the locations where these species are gonna be, but also looking at different management scenarios. So given those changes, if we, for instance, were gonna do some riparian planting, like this picture that I'm showing on the right, or if we were gonna upgrade culverts or do some in-stream channel uh, changes, like here, there's a, a log structure that was put in to create some habitat diversity. How will these uh, changes or implementation of management actions actually change either improve conditions for uh, species or um, perhaps even make them worse because if they're migrating somewhere they shouldn't be migrating to, that may um, set up a scenario where we're uh, setting up something like an ecological trap, an area where fish can, or other species can get caught and not come out of um, and succeed into the future. So these are all questions we're tackling right now. Um, again, I mentioned that all of these issues are very complex, but it's very exciting to be in a place where we're motivated not to just document the kind of detriments of climate change, but actually think of what we can do about it um, and think of it in a kind of forward looking and positive way. So that was a lot of information to give you all, uh, but I hope that you get a sense of the breadth of work that we're doing with Mass Wildlife. And I hope um, that it was informative and interesting to you. And uh, um, I'll open up to questions if there are any. Well, Becca, first of all, I just want to say thank you so very much for your wonderful work and just the depth of knowledge um, is your depth of knowledge is just tremendous. And thank you so much for your impressive presentation. Thank so you. Really appreciate that. Yeah, if you have any questions, I'm looking in the chat now. Uh, here's a question. Are changes in the uh, riparian vegetation considered in the models? So the models right now look at uh, cover. So the overall cover, tree cover in riparian areas, I believe is 250 meters away from each water's edge, rather than looking, if you're thinking about changes in species, for instance, as we lose 
for instance, hemlock and what is what is being changed there, then that is not where we're at. It, it, we recognize that it's really important to look at say changes in coniferous forest to to deciduous forests in these areas, but the models are not there. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, let's see. Comment, uh, could you comment about aquatic animal mammals uh, such as beavers? I can make a lot of comments about beavers. I'm, I'm a beaver fan, I admit it. It's not a common um, a perception in a lot of the meetings I'm involved in. Uh, certainly beavers have been documented to really help with inland flooding issues where they can uh, create wetlands, uh, recharge uh, things like aquifers, um, they can ameliorate um, temperatures downstream because they have more groundwater upwelling, but, but the issues are real. You know, these, these uh, studies have largely been done in the Pacific Northwest where there's a lot of land. Beavers can do their thing and not flood private property. Um, but, but there has to be, I, I believe there has to be a way to incorporate how beavers manage um, their wetlands in order to actually uh, incorporate into these ecosystem uh, analyses. We have not done that, but but yes, thank you for that question. It's uh, I know there are folks at UMass Amherst who are working on that particular question. Mm, okay, good to know. Um, besides brook trout, what are some other indicator species for cold water habitat? Oh goodness, so we have a, a total of 11 fish species that are cold water habitat species. And so uh, all the trout, so lake trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, and brook trout. Then we have uh, American brook uh, lamprey. Um, we have long nose sucker and a variety of other species. I don't need to list them all, but yes, there, there are, when you're talking about cold water streams, there is a whole slew slimy scalp and being another one. Uh, and the full list is available at mass.gov. <laughs> if you look at water, cold water fish resources, you'll find it. Okay. Um, uh, one of the participants would like to know who was working on beavers at UMass. That's a good question. So the I don't have a name. The person that comes to mind who has brought it up uh, and some of the and some of the meetings I've been is Keith Nislow. He's with U.S. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service that is centered, um, I, I guess it's an, an offshoot, it's a research lab uh, at UMass. Um, but he, I will point you towards him <laughs> if you really wanna follow up. Okay, good. Are there key aquatic species interactions that might be affected? Key, I'm sorry, tell me again the question, key are interactions. There, are there key aquatic species interactions that might be affected? Oh, absolutely. And so uh, when we think about changes in phenology, so say changes in the timing of lag stages of fishes, um, thinking, or even mussels, when you're thinking about uh, the timing of say the food sources and how they're responding, there's a whole concern about mismatch, right? So the say the larvae if spawning is going on um, earlier for fishes, perhaps the larvae of aquatic insects that they would feed upon normally may not be tracking at the same time. And so you may have these fry of fishes, these juvenile fishes coming out of their eggs ready to feed and they're not finding the food source or it's a different food source. You know, we don't know if they would have the same caloric uh, value. There's other concerns for sure. Um, where mussels are concerned, you know, if migration, fish migrations are happening differently, the way that mussels disperse their young, the Glochidia, that are little clams with big teeth that will attach to fish gills. I apologize for any mussel people out there that I'm very rudimentally explaining that. But if you can think about the changes in migration in fishes, and if that is out of sync when the freshwater mussels are ready to release those larvae um, to be picked up by the fishes, that would also be a concern. So there, there is a slew of interactions that we know we need to be concerned about and the concern that really we're gonna be looking at novel assemblages, novel ecosystems resulting from species behaving or reacting differently to these changes? Mm. Oh, good answer. Um, here's a question actually about mussels. Do you know of anyone regionally using freshwater mussels as a way to reclaim or clean up degraded freshwaters? 
Oh, that's a good question. And um, I do not know offhand. Our freshwater um, mussel expert is Jason Carmignani. Uh, he works for the, the uh, Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program part of Mass Wildlife. Um, he could. He works with many other folks. There's a huge group across uh, the Eastern Seaboard that are working together. Um, so I will point you to him. I'm sorry, I don't. I do not know that answer. Okay. Do these studies account for various water quality issues due to development or impervious surface areas, et cetera, in the watershed? Yes. So that is one. Um, absolutely. So this this bigger regional. Uh, effort that I mentioned, uh, looking at all six uh, New England states and biodiversity across it. Uh, certainly, we're taking into account um, uh, uh, CSOs, the potential for water pollution from these combined sewage uh, outfalls, the idea that water quality um, is at risk from um, inland flooding. We're looking at impervious surfaces uh, as a management action. If we actually daylight parking lots and roads, can we improve conditions to um, mitigate for increased erosion and other issues that we see with uh, precipitation patterns changing and perhaps affecting aquatic habitats. So yes, we are incorporating them. They're always a need for data, um, but we're, we're drawing as much as we can from what's out there. Mm, okay, good to know. During last summer's droughts, um, Allison observed large die-off of fingernail clams in Mill River and Waitley. Are you monitoring them as well as mussels? Goodness, I you know I hadn't heard about that, um, and that is the kind of information we would want to hear about. Um, certainly, we have a fish kill hotline that's active all summer, and if you just put in fish kill at mass.gov, you'll get that information. Um, Normally, uh, you know, information goes to DEP or the uh, the environmental police. Um, they're also tracking that stuff, but I had not heard of that, and and certainly that would be of interest to us. Okay. Uh, Jason at Mass Wildlife for freshwater shellfish uh, contact info. Yep. Uh, Jason dot C A R M I G N A. Yeah, hey, sorry, C A R M I G N I A at mass.gov. <laughs> I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, put that in the chat. Thanks. Um, someone noticed in your first slide uh, map of cold water streams in Massachusetts um, that Eastern Mass was largely devoid of its habitat reasons. It's 100% true. So if you think historically, all of Massachusetts would have been cold water habitat, right? Like before, you know, before anyone colonized the area. Um, but what's happened is that the effects from urban development have a huge impact on those streams. And so we see that um, for the large part, as someone mentioned impervious surfaces, those are areas that are paved. Um, when you see areas that are largely paved and the concentrations of those in particular watersheds, you don't, you don't see cold water streams and, and it, they're highly correlated. Um, it also has to do with water demands. You may have a lot of um, water withdrawal that, that makes shallower streams warmer. Um, so yes, so that the effect, if you, if you look at that map, you can actually point out where Boston is, where Worcester is, you know, where those kind of uh, high density areas um, are for urban development. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, any other questions? These questions have been great and as have your answers. Um, thank you all very, very much for attending this evening's Castro Land Trust um, online speaker series. And thank you again, Becca, for your good work and your great presentation. And um, we, will, we will be in touch with everybody and um, ha have a good evening. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good night. Bye -bye.